Hi there, my name is Mike Daniel and I'm really glad you're joining us. I started last week talking about uh, a passage out of Romans 5 and I'm excited to continue uh, where we left off, but I want to tie together some passages, the one that we talked about last week and the one we're talking about uh, this week, and it will actually segue into uh, what we will talk about next week. Not only that, but uh, what Paul is talking about in this first half of Romans 5 is actually a precursor, a necessary foundation for what he's going to do first in Romans 6 and then uh, a little segue he makes in Romans 7. But then in Romans 8, he returns to this exact same topic of the indwelling life of Christ, our being in Jesus and Jesus being in us. So here's a theme, a mystery that Paul continues to unravel for us. So it begins largely right here in Romans 5. So here's what we read last week. It says in Romans 5, 1, that therefore, since we've been justified by faith, in other words, we received something from God that we didn't deserve, our willingness to receive what we could not produce or cause or earn in any way, that was our faith. We received it by faith. He caused it by grace. So it was by faith, not our effort, not our merit, that we have been justified. We've been made right. Our accounts have been reconciled. So we've been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we've also obtained access by that same faith, receiving, not causing, that same faith into this grace, this new economy of living with God, not just being justified by grace, but entering into this new economy, this new life and lifestyle that operates by grace uh, in which we now stand. Uh, and he goes on and says, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, here's this wonderful beginning piece that I want to talk about this week. Last week we talked about what it meant to uh, sort of deal with suffering where we've entered into grace and we're going through suffering and God is bringing about this wonderful character development in our dependence and intimacy with him. But I want to highlight this week, uh, last week I briefly referred to a celebration sandwich and this is the top layer of that sandwich, the bread, if you will, of that sandwich or maybe the bottom uh, bun of the sandwich, the bottom bread of the sandwich. It's the rejoice or celebrate. He says, rejoice, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And I talked about last week how our hope is not wishful thinking. It's where we put our assurance. It's where we put our trust. It's what we're depending upon. I'm putting my hope in the chair that I'm sitting on right now and it is holding me up. Well, that wasn't wishing it would hold me up. It wasn't thinking maybe if I'm really lucky and God's really faithful and everything works out just right, this chair will hold me up. No, my hope in this chair is well founded. It is an assurance that when I sit down, I don't have to be careful about it it's going to hold me up. That's where my hope lies when I sat down. I, I wasn't questioning, wasn't thinking maybe, but we'll see. It was an assurance of something that had yet to happen. That's what the Bible means when it says hope. So the very first rejoicing, the very first celebration, the first bread in the sandwich of celebration is that we're hoping, we rejoice in the hope, the assurance of the glory of God. Listen, he's saying that the indwelling life of Christ is where we have assurance that God will bring glory to himself and he'll use us to do it. In Colossians, Paul said that Christ in you, not apart from you, not despite you, not uh, in avoiding you, it's not you becoming less so that he can become more now that you are in Christ. That was John the Baptist's ministry had to become less. It was all about the foretelling of Christ. And now that Christ had come, John was saying, I have to become less. My ministry has to become less. My uh, life as a headliner in the spiritual realm is going to become less because it was all about the coming of Christ. And he's now going to become more. I must become less in my ministry as the forebearer of Christ so that he now, having come, can become the headliner in the spiritual realm. So John the Baptist's ministry became less so that Christ's ministry could become 
more, but in no way does that mean that we who are newly reborn in Christ and dwelt by him, he's not trying to make us less or get us out of the way. We're the very instruments through which he's going to bring about God's glory on the earth. Jesus is physically walking around on the earth today in one way and one way only. He's being made known today on the earth in one way and one way only. In Colossians, Paul says to the church in Colossae, that way, the one and only hope of the glory of God is the indwelling life of Jesus Christ by grace within you. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Well, he's making that same statement here in Romans 5. He's saying we, because of the grace in which we now stand, have strong, firm, unbending assurance. Our hope, our trust, our confidence is not in what we can accomplish for him, but because of the grace in which we now stand, it's the glory of God in which he can accomplish through us, with us, in us. Uh, from within us. So it's God's doing through Christ within us, by us. It's through us that he will glorify himself, not apart from us, but as the core part of us. So he's saying that Christ in you is the hope of glory and Christ is in you by grace. And so it's by that grace of his indwelling life that God is going to be glorified, that his renown is going to be increased, that his namesake is going to be edified in the earth. Christ in you, his grace, his goodness, his power, his life within you is the one and only hope of the glory of God. So in this grace in which we now stand, we trust that the glory of God, we celebrate that the glory of God will be accomplished by that very grace in which we now stand. We celebrate, we rejoice in the hope that we have in this grace in which we stand for the glory of God. That's the first celebration. But watch what he says. I'm going to keep reading. It says, so we rejoice from this grace in which we now stand. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, knowing, and this is what we talked about last week. I'm just going to run through it, knowing that the suffering produces endurance and endurance, endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not uh, put us to shame or disappoint us, some versions say, because God's love is already poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. In other words, because we already have all things in Christ, we're already standing in grace. Everything that God allows in our circumstances, he brings about for his glory and our edification as we depend upon him. His grace is magnified through us as we depend upon his life within us. Everything serves to edify the glory of God in our circumstances because of the indwelling presence of Christ within us by grace. We'll keep going. So the first uh, bread of celebration, right, the first celebration in the celebration sandwich was we're hoping in the glory of God. Uh, we have assurance of the glory of God because of the grace in which we now stand. And the second celebration is that because we're already in grace, because we're already uh, have the fullness of Christ by grace because we already have every spiritual blessing in Christ, according to Ephesians 1 and 2 Peter 1 3. Because that's already, we're already made new, we're already whole, we're already complete in Him. We don't always act like it, we certainly don't always feel like it, but it's grace that we're standing in, not competence. It's Christ confidence, not self competence, in which we are putting our hope. So we rejoice that in that grace, God's going to be glorified through us. We also rejoice in the midst of our suffering because we already have all things in Christ. We can persevere and endure and put our hope in him and he can be glorified even as we are raised up. We grow up in the very grace in which we stand. So increasingly, we demonstrate the grace of God in our life. Not only do we have hope in the glory of God because of the grace that we're in, but we can rejoice in our suffering because of the grace that we're in. We lack for nothing in the fullness of Christ, so we increasingly live from him and decreasingly try to live from the flesh and the circumstances. So we rejoice first in the assurance of the glory of God through us by grace, and then we rejoice, the meat of the sandwich, if you will, in the midst of our suffering because we know that he is going to be made manifest 
in his sufficiency to us by grace, even when the circumstances aren't good enough. Even when we don't have circumstantial needs being met, he is sufficient for what we need. I mean, that, doesn't that glorify his grace even more? If my circumstances are going wonderful, they'll just go, wow, Mike's life is great. But if my circumstances are going horribly and people look at me and they see joy that only God could produce and peace that only God could produce in the midst of chaos and uh, uh, they see rest in the midst of uh, struggling circumstances and they see patience in the midst of patience being tried and they see love in the midst of uh, hateful people and rejection from others. They see that I'm walking in acceptance and joy and fulfillment in the midst of circumstances that couldn't possibly provide those things. Then in the midst of those trials, in the midst of that suffering, we can rejoice because his sufficiency puts his life on display in us. They sure can see the source of the fruit when it's clearly in the midst of struggle. So we rejoice in the suffering because God's strength is made even more manifest in the midst of those circumstances. We rejoice uh, because of the grace that we're in. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God and we rejoice in that same way. We rejoice even in our suffering because it makes that grace even more manifest as we learn to depend upon him and grow up in that grace. But he keeps going from there. There's yet another reason why we rejoice. The, the top bread of that sandwich, if you will, he says, not only do we rejoice in the assurance of the glory of God, and not only do we rejoice in our sufferings because his glory is uh, even more clear in the midst of that, and we grow up in the midst of that in our dependence and intimacy with him, but he says, not only does our hope not disappoint us because God's love's already been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given, who has been given to us, for we were, uh, when, while we were still weak, at just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Doesn't that put his love on display? That when we were ungodly, when we were independent of him, when we were rebellious, he gave his life for us, not because of what we would do in response to him, but because of his love for us, regardless of what we did. His grace just on display. So while we were still weak, at just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, someone who might deserve it, right? Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, when we didn't deserve it, when we're actually in rebellion against God, he took the price paid the cost of our rebellion so that we didn't have to die for our sins against him my friend frank friedman makes this great illustration of this he says occasionally you hear somebody who when uh, the enemy throws a grenade into their their trench or in their foxhole someone jumps on the grenade so it doesn't kill his buddies and they all leave going this guy gave his life for us we continued to fight and we won the battle because he jumped on the grenade from the enemy at us. What God has done is run across the battlefield and jumped on the grenade that we were throwing at him so that it didn't kill us. Our sin in rebellion against God condemned us to death and he took the grenade that we threw at him so that it didn't kill us. Isn't that amazing? I love that illustration from Frank. He showed our love God, Christ showed his love for us and that while we were still in rebellion against us, he paid the cost of our rebellion against him. I may have said that wrong. While we were still in rebellion against him, he paid the penalty of the rebellion so we didn't destroy ourselves in our sin against him. It was against him and he died to pay for our sin against him. It's amazing to me. He ran across the battle lines that we drew in our sin and he jumped on the grenade of our sin that was going to destroy us in our rebellion against him so that we would, instead of warring against him, we would receive his love and operate by grace and dependence upon him and grow in intimacy with him and live from relationship with him instead of out of our own, attempting to live out of our own self-righteousness, our own self-determination, our own hope in the flesh, that we would increasingly put our hope in the sufficiency and love and trustworthiness of Christ himself. Boy, what love. He showed his love for us and that while we were in rebellion and sin against him, he gave his life to pay for that rebellion against him.
God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now already, you're not trying to do this, since we now have already been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. So in other words, we've been justified. Our sin has been paid for, then most certainly we'll be spared because we've already been justified as a sinner. Now that we've been uh, reconciled and are no longer by nature sinners, now that we're no longer uh, uh, have sin held against us, then surely now that we're uh, cleansed by his blood, we'll be saved from his wrath. He, he paid the price while we were sinners for our sin. How much more then will we be saved from God's wrath against sin uh, now that we're no longer having sin held against us. It's beautiful. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. If when we were sinners, he died to pay our penalty pay our debt, then how much more now that we're no longer by nature sinners, we've been redeemed and cleansed and forever forgiven, how much more now will we be saved into eternal life by his resurrection? Isn't that beautiful? Now watch this. So much more then, we also rejoice, that's the third occurrence, in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we now received reconciliation. Let me put all these things together and I'll wrap it up. Paul is saying we rejoice first of all in our assurance of the glory of God. We're standing in grace and so he's going to bring about his glory. It's not up to us. And then second of all, we rejoice even in our suffering because his grace is sufficient for us. He can grow us in our dependence and intimacy with him and put his grace on display to the world around us. As we mature and he becomes more conspicuous through us, our suffering is a cause for rejoicing because of that. It grows us up and puts his grace on display. And then finally, because he died for the ungodly to, to make us compatible with his life, how much more than will we experience his life eternally? Will we be saved forever in his resurrection? So therefore, number three, we rejoice that in Jesus Christ we are reconciled. In fact, we don't just rejoice, even more we rejoice even more, more than the grace in which we now stand that brings God glory, more than the grace that through our suffering proves sufficient so his grace is put on display to the world, more than his provision, more than our salvation, we rejoice in our reconciliation with the Father. Jesus Christ is not only provided for our sin, He's brought us into fellowship with the Father. Jesus Christ is not only sufficient for us in our suffering, he has brought us into relationship with the Father. More than celebrating the grace in which we stand, more than celebrating uh, the glory of God through Christ in us, more than celebrating his sufficiency for us and his glory in the midst of our suffering because of his sufficiency to us by grace, more than any of those things, much more than those things in which we rejoice, we rejoice in being reconciled in Christ to the Father. That's what the joy was for Jesus going to the cross, that ultimately is our greatest joy in having received his work on the cross. We celebrate increasingly more than even having been saved from wrath, more than having to pay, uh, no longer having to pay the penalty of our own sin, more than even his sufficiency for us in the midst of suffering. We celebrate more than anything else, much more. We rejoice that in Jesus Christ we're reconciled in perfect and holy, eternal relationship with God as our Father. Look, Jesus didn't die just, just so that we would be forgiven. He died so that his blood having uh, paid for our sin, he could then bring us into reconciliation with the Father. The payment for our sin is done, but the relationship with the Father is eternal. The work that he's doing through suffering is temporal in this life. But once this life is over and there's no more suffering and no more tears, the life that we have with the Father is eternal. More than sufficiency in suffering for the glory of God. More than the grace in which we now stand. Even more than the fact that we have just been forgiven for our sins against the Father, we have been brought into perfect fellowship with the Father through Jesus Christ. So we rejoice 
in the glory of God because of the grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice through suffering because he is still sufficient and we've already received his love and we're already standing in grace. So the trials just prove his sufficiency in our life. But more than any of that temporal stuff, even more than being once and forever forgiven of our sins, we rejoice in the fellowship with the Father that has been given to us in the person of Jesus Christ. That is even better than all that was necessary to bring it about, right? He's put us in grace because that's how he's going to be sufficient through us. And he's sufficient through us so that he can be glorified in our midst. And all of that was only possible because of the blood that forgave us of our sins in the first place and the love that he proved uh, in the midst of it. But all of that is far secondary and tertiary compared to the surpassing riches of knowing the Father in Jesus Christ whom he's sent. Our life is not just that we're forgiven. Our life eternal is not just that we can get through tough circumstances. Our life is not even that in this temporal world God will use us to make himself known and to bring himself glory. Our life is knowing God the Father in Jesus Christ whom he sent. That's eternal life to us. So this this uh, rejoicing celebration sandwich is that he will bring about his glory through us. It's not up to us. It's all grace of Christ in you. That's the hope of glory. And that in the midst of our suffering, he proves himself sufficient. So it's even better that we would have trials and he's sufficient for us through those trials than if we never had those trials and he just made the circumstances sufficient, right? He's just as sufficient for me, but it puts that on display and grows me up in my dependence upon him in the midst of trials. But even more than those things, he loved me even when I was in rebellion against him so I can trust him and walk in fellowship with him and live in perfect reconciled relationship with God the Father, eternally enjoying him as he enjoys me. It's all made possible by grace, but it's all for relationship through Christ. I hope that encourages you today. I hope that you will rejoice that you stand in grace and it's his grace that will bring him glory, not your effort and merit, that you would rejoice when things look difficult, his grace is sufficient. And when things don't look difficult, his grace is still necessary. So you're still able to live by his grace no matter what you lack for nothing in Jesus Christ. Circumstances might be hard. They might not be a good source, but God is always a good source and ultimately better than any of that. Even, even better than just being forgiven, we get to walk in fellowship with the Father who loved us and created us to be recipients of that love. The Father loves us by giving us provision and direction, and we as children of God receive. Our love receives and uh, follows that provision and direction, and that's how the love of the Father and the love of his children continue for eternity. He gives and directs, we receive and follow, and he gives and directs, and we receive and follow, and father and child, child and father, live eternally in perfect union and fellowship through Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, as all of us as his co-heirs by grace enter into their perfect eternal relationship with him. I hope you are encouraged. Walk in his ridiculous grace today, knowing that his greatest joy, his greatest benefit, the, the thing that made the cross not only worthwhile, but brought him joy in going to the cross is that he left heaven, giving up everything that we might be in relationship with him. And he went back to heaven in fellowship with us who receive him. And it was worth it to him. You were worth the cross to Jesus Christ. How much more than should we think that this temporal life is worth whatever it takes for us to enjoy that same fellowship with the Father. Have a great day. Love you guys.